Good morning. Good morning. A very warm welcome to the worship of God. A special welcome to any visitors who may be with us today. Um, usual tea and coffee through in the large hall after the service. Do join us there for a time of fellowship together. We're now in the week of prayer for Christian unity. It runs from 18th to 25th of January this year. It was good that it happened to be the Thursday the 18th of January uh, when we had a meeting of the Hoyk Church leaders here in Teviot to discuss the uh, forthcoming mission uh, in May with Revive Scotland with Rob MacArthur and David Clark from Revive Scotland on Zoom and the rest of us in person uh, for a nice lunch and then a meeting together. The meeting went well. There's still much to be done. More information will be forthcoming, but it's exciting to have that display of unity among the church leaders at the start of this uh, run-in towards May. So we'll pray today for the unity of the church and for the forthcoming mission in our prayers later on. The prayer meeting 7 p.m. on Thursday evening on Zoom. Ask me for the link if you need that. We're delighted that this week uh, Sam and Ruth Lee are going to be joining us on Zoom from the Netherlands to update us on what they're doing, our mission partners. They are the member they were in um, uh, Southeast Asia, but they're now working uh, to see people going out into the mission field based in the Netherlands. So we'll hear from them and we'll pray for them on Thursday at the prayer meeting. Next Sunday, service is the same times, 9.45 at TV at 11.15 at St. Mary's. And then next Sunday afternoon, a change of, well, there's, there's been a meeting already in January, but there's another one for the Meadshaw, uh, what's called the Discipleship Explorer. We're now calling it Connect Group. 28th of January, next Sunday, uh, 3 p.m. at Meadshaw. We'll have another meeting there of the group. All welcome to that. And the deadline for newsletter articles is uh, Tuesday, uh, for, to be sent to Joe Mayberry, Tuesday 23rd of January for the newsletter articles. Just thought I'd share something from Barnabas Aid. Uh, yesterday in their prayer diary that I use, uh, there was an entry about Nagorno-Karabakh. I thought you'd be interested to hear this report from yesterday, given our Christmas appeal for those that, the people there through Barnabas Aid. In the midst of heavy shelling, all the children were safely evacuated from the village in an operation organized by the mayor, all except Michael, aged 10, and Nver, aged 8, the mayor's own sons who were yet to leave the village. A few days after the attack began, both boys were found dead. This family tragedy occurred in Sarnak, Buer village in Nagorno-Karabakh, as the Armenian Christian population of the enclave fled en masse following Azerbaijan's attack on the 19th September. And as we know, almost the entire population of 120,000 are now in Armenia. They arrived malnourished after a nine-month blockade. They are traumatized, traumatized and grieving for their lost homes and homeland now under Azerbaijan's control. Most have no work and nowhere to live long term. So that's where our over a thousand pounds went, privileged to be able to support that. In the midst of all the other things that are going on, so much need in the world, we were able to support that specific uh, need. And we'll pray in our prayers later on for that work as well. So let us worship God. I've got responses this morning. I'll say the first bit and you can join in with the second bit each time. Lord, open our lips. God, make speed to save us. Lord, make haste to help us. Amen. So our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of Hosts. We'll stand to sing if we're able.
Let us pray. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we acknowledge that you are holy. As the angels called out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of your glory, as we have just sung. Holy Lord, you are dazzlingly perfect in who you are, in all you do. We give you the glory that is your right and due. We gladly bow ourselves before you and acknowledge who you are this morning as we come, as we come into your presence. Who are we to come? For in ourselves, we would not be able to come to you. But how amazing it is that because of what you have done for us in your amazing grace, totally undeserved, not because of anything we have done or ever could do, but because of what Jesus Christ, your Son, has done, we can come into your presence through faith in Him. For He died for us to take away our sin and cleanse us from all sin, to clothe us, robe us with your righteousness so that we come to you through Him, through His death and resurrection as your beloved children, able to call you Father, and amazingly be seen by you as holy in your sight and blameless. That is amazing, Father. And we come and we worship you, Abba, Father, as your children. We come confessing our sins to you, our pride and unbelief and lack of trust. Whatever it is, you know it, we know it, we confess it to you. May we know the assurance of your forgiveness as you have promised, as we confess our sins, trust in Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the joyful place you have brought us into as believers in your Son, that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ, that we are near to your heart as your own children. Nothing can separate us from your love in Jesus for the sure hope you have given us in Jesus through his death and resurrection of being with you forever with all your people. So we join in with all the angels and with all creation, with all those around the world and through the ages who have trusted in Jesus to worship and adore you with grateful hearts. We lift our hearts to you, Lord. We bless you. Give us open hearts to listen to what you have to say to us today through your word and by your Holy Spirit working in us. Lead us and teach us and bless this time together for your glory and our good and for the good of many others through us. We bring all our prayers in Jesus' name and continue now in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I should just say that uh, we should be thankful we're in the church today, and not in the hall. Andy did a lot of work with the heating yesterday, so the Heating is working again today. Uh, just thought I'd mention that and thank Andy for his work in that. Also, Ashley, who's normally here at the front, is away preaching today in People's Baptist Church, a small church that seems to be struggling but has got great hopes. So he's away supporting them, taking the service today. Joyce is going to come now and bring us our Bible readings.
Our readings this morning are both taken from the New Testament, the first of which can be found at the bottom of page 96, Luke 13, from verse 1. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should I use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig round it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Then turning to page 316, beginning at Revelation 8, 13, and reading on into 9. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in mid-air call out in a loud voice, Woe! Woe! Woe to the inhabitants of the earth! because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stings, like scorpions, and in their tails, they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, destroyer. Amen. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, the confusion about the page numbers is, I think, Joyce, you've taken the Good News Bibles that sit on the side. Uh, it's page 1239, the NIV numbers from Genesis to Revelation, but it's the Good News numbers, the Old Testament and New Testament separately. Uh, but we'll come back to that. Page 1239 is the reading from Revelation. Revelation. 
So before we come to look at God's Word, let's sing together, Salvation Belongs to Our God. Other words from Revelation this song is based on. Stand to sing. The trumpets are sounding here in Revelation, seven of them in turn, there's the sound of a shofar there. Trumpets sound in this case in warning, wake up call. We had the first four last Sunday. These trumpets seem to be indicating all kinds of events that might happen between John's day through our day through to the second coming of Christ beyond. Come through them as we go through the seven trumpets. The first four, challenging stuff we looked at last week where the environment in which human beings live affected, judged partially. So the land we rely on for our food supply, the the seas and the sea creatures and maritime trade and, and the water supply made bitter and deathly. And then the light itself affected, plunging people into darkness, to borrow the words from 
Exodus darkness that can be felt. All partial, a third here, third there, partial. We hear echoes of the plagues that God brought in Egypt when His people were in slavery here, uh, in particular the plague of hail, uh, rivers becoming blood, darkness that could be felt, and then we'll see today another plague referenced, the plague of locusts. Uh, these plagues came in Pharaoh and the people to show them God's power and glory and as judgment on them and their sin, particularly their harsh treatment of the Israelites, who of course were in slavery in Egypt. They came as a warning, a perfectly fair judgment from God in response to sin, but as a warning. A trumpet sounds. It's like that with the trumpets here in Revelation. They are God's judgment. They come at least in part in response to the prayers that we heard of the martyrs when we looked at the seven seals being opened up, revealing God's purposes in Christ for the whole of history. And we saw these martyrs crying out to God for vindication, how long before you bring justice? So these trumpets are partly in res at least in response to that. The trumpets call people to turn from the dangerous direction they are heading in and turn to God who can save them. And that is solemn, but so necessary. Solemn signs of the mercy of God. What C.S. Lewis calls God's severe mercy. You'll go to those lengths in His grace. The explore notes yesterday that I we use in the early chapters of Ezekiel said this. When we find the idea of God's wrath too difficult or even unpalatable, God's judgment, it is because we are treating sin too lightly. Is that not true? But even in His wrath, the Lord remembers mercy use Habakkuk's words. God will go to such lengths to save. We see that amazingly, of course, supremely in His Son Jesus going to the cross to bear our sins, bearing the judgment of God on Himself in all its, the awfulness of our sin and the awfulness of that judgment in the love of God. God so loved the world that He gave His Son so that as we turn to Him in faith, we can be forgiven and saved and have eternal life. This is the robustness of the Christian faith, friends. It's robust. It's real. It's deep. It engages with the way things really are. Not in a nice kind of fairy tale sense, but really, actually, in God's purposes. That's why we sing to God and give Him, or we're doing that, all wisdom and power and honor be to you, Lord God, because you know what you're doing, and we trust you even when we don't understand. So we come to the fifth trumpet. Uh, this trumpet and the next two are introduced by verse 13 of the previous chapter, chapter 8. As always, it would be good if you could be following through as we go through this, because these sermons without the actual text in front of you well, any sermon without the text in front of you isn't really a sermon because it's based on the Word of God as we seek to interpret and apply it. So it's page 1239 of the Pew Bibles. The NIV Pew Bibles are in the center. There are some good news ones up the side. Uh, so if you, uh, page numbers that Joyce gave will apply if you're in the side there. As I watched, verse, chapter 8, verse 13 says, as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Woe, 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 shouts the eagle. Does that remind you of anything else? We sang in our opening hymn, Holy holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
Isaiah's vision of the glory of God in the temple, these angels are singing of, of the superlative glory of holiness of God in His essential nature, who He is. It's all about God. And what we have here, woe, woe, woe is a kind of negative of that. Woe is an ex exclamation of pain and anger, and the threefold repeat of it uh, suggests superlative woe. Woe, addressed not to God, but to the inhabitants of the earth. That's like a kind of technical term in Revelation, which speaks about people whose actual home is the earth. Uh, they are at home in this world. They live without reference to God. They are under the sway of the devil, the prince of this world. The inhabitants of the earth refer to those, not, just, not all the inhabitants of the earth, those who are living without God. It's to them that these woes are addressed. Woe, woe, woe. So holy, 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 our God Almighty, but woe, woe, woe to those without God. It's appropriate that an eagle announces these woes because an eagle can be a sign of judgment. Hosea speaks of, um, says, put the trumpets to your lips. An eagle is over the house of the Lord because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. An eagle can be a sign of judgment. But an eagle is also a sign of grace. Lovely picture that God describes what he did in the Exodus when he brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. How does he describe it? You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. Exodus 19 verse four. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. A lovely picture, put me in mind of the Lord of the Rings. The eagles appear twice in the Lord of the Rings books. And one of them, you see it in the film. Have you seen the film? Don't need to say. I, um, great, f long films, but excellent films. And the, the, the Gandalf and Bilbo Baggins and the dwarves are, uh, they've been, uh, they can't escape. And they, at one point, have been almost defeated. And there's no way out. And then what happens? These giant eagles come and pick them up and carry them to safety on a high shelf somewhere, carried on eagle's wings. So what a lovely picture that is. So here we go, this eagle is declaring these woes. So in the eagle itself, you've got this combination of a picture of judgment, but <coughs> also the purpose of that being to rescue people in God's mercy in response to these judgments. So we turn to the first of these three woes, the fifth trumpet. And we do the best we can under God to interpret these difficult verses, but profitable for us, we pray. Just a word of prayer before we go further. Lord God, please bless this, um, focusing on this part of your word. Lord Jesus' words through John to us, that you will take them and use them in our lives, the life of your church and from the lives of others, in our living, in response to our relation to others, in our prayers and everything. Use these words, my weak words, from your powerful word to achieve your purposes today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So let's look first at the source of this woe, this fifth trumpet, which is the first of the three woes. Trumpets five, six, seven are these three woes. So the source of this woe. Listen again to the first three verses of chapter nine. If you have it open there, you can look at it. Verses one to three of chapter nine. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. So we see the picture language 
of this solemn vision. Once again, a star has fallen. We saw it in, that in the, one of the previous trumpets. Was it the fourth one? Fourth one. Star has fallen. A fallen angel it seems to refer to a fallen angel. It does refer to a fallen angel, probably the devil himself. In Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The devil is a fallen angel, cast out of heaven for his rebellion and pride, wanting to be God. Jesus won the victory over him at the cross. He remains active, though, as a defeated foe he is. And his final defeat awaits Jesus' return. I'll read about that later in Revelation. And we learn in verse 11 of our reading today that the name of this angel is Abaddon in Hebrew or Apollyon in Greek. Both of them mean destroyer. This is the devil. The devil destroys, brings deception, death, delusion, whatever it is, all these Ds, the devil. The destroyer. So this star, that is the angel, the devil, is given the key to the shaft of the abyss. I think of the Lord of the Rings again when I think of this abyss, these horrible pictures of these orcs and things underground, if you've seen the films. Just, just evil. But anyway, the devil, this angel, is given, notice that, is given the key. He's given the key. It's a passive. It means that, yes, God has given him the key. The devil does not have authority of his own, authority, any authority, doesn't have authority of his own independent of God. We're not dualists, the devil's there and God's here and it's a battle. The key is given to the devil. He can only operate within the overarching purposes and authority of God. God allows him, permits him to do things. He uses him in his purposes. There's mystery here. We see something of that in Job, where behind the scenes, the devil asks to be able to come against Job in the heavenly places, and uh, God allows Job to do it because Satan to do it because he's going to work out his purposes for Job and f to reveal who he is and mystery of all that. So Satan is given this key. He uses it to open the shaft to the abyss. Smoke pours out of this, like a big furnace, quite a picture, isn't it? Giant furnace and fire and the smoke comes up as it's opened up and the smoke comes up and out of this come Locusts, the sky's darkened. It's a picture of hell. The destruction and darkness and evil of it all. These locusts. Not again, verse 4. They are given power. Verse 3, rather. How did the smoke locusts came down the earth and were given power, like that of the scorpions of the earth? Again given power. They have this ability only because God has allowed them to have this ability. Uh, these evil creatures are a means of the judgments that we're looking at coming about. Uh, under the control of the devil, their king. But once again, they're not autonomous in this. The devil and his allies pursue their own agendas. But in all of this, they are bringing about God's purposes and his sovereignty, his wisdom, his authority. God did that with the Babylonians, by the way, in bringing, taking his own people into exile. He didn't approve of the Babylonians' wickedness, but he used them to come and take his people into exile because of their sin. And then they, in turn, the Babylonians would be judged by God too. So what's the source of this war? To get back to our heading, the source of this war the devil and his evil powers, yes, the locusts. But they are under the sovereign hand of the just and holy God, for it is God who is behind this, who is working out his purposes through it in his judgment and mercy. That's the source of this woe. Are you with me still? 
deep stuff, this? Evil? God is on his throne. That's what Revelation tells us. And we trust that he knows what he's doing. <sighs> Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we come to the nature of this woe. Next. The first four trumpets related in partial destruction of the environment in which human beings live. These next three, this one and the next ones, affect human beings themselves. It's a bit like Job. His family, his work, his livelihood was affected. And then next, his health was affected terribly. So let's read on, verse 4. The locusts were told, that's authority again, not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They are limited in what they can do, though what they can do is serious. And this limitation relates back to chapter 7 when we saw a seal being put on the forehead of those who belong to God, those who are Christians, those who are believers in Christ. They are sealed so that they can stand in the judgment where the locusts go out, therefore, not to harm those who don't have the seal, but only those who do, those who do have the seal, but only those who do not have the seal of God. The focus of their activity is on those who do not have the seal, those who do not belong to Christ. This is solemn indeed. Here are verses 5 and 6. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes during those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. Here is a severe mercy we mentioned earlier. These torments, these tortures, that's what the word means. What are they? We're not told. Presumably, they are the physical, psychological, spiritual afflictions that affect people. Remember, it's only those who do not have the seal of God on their forehead, those who do not belong to Christ, what they suffer like this through the whole age between the first and second comings of Christ. Now, this is hard to understand because we know that Christians suffer in this fallen world, as does everyone else, with cancer, heart attacks, accidents, death, stress, troubles of all kinds, afflictions, yeah? So what's this about? Well, spiritually, there is a difference, of course, in any event. As Christians, we have the hand of God's protection on us. In and through all that happens, we have the promise that for those who love God, that's believers in Christ, who are called according to his purposes, all things work together for good. He is working it out, and we will be with him in glory. Assurance that unbelievers don't have. These woes are directed to unbelievers. Here's what Kevin DeYoung, one of the speakers at the conference that was at the other week, he says this. So what earthly torment do unbelievers face that Christians don't? or at least that Christians should not face. Here's what I think is the answer, and we'll see it in the weeks ahead in Revelation, referring to later chapters in Revelation. The answer, says Kevin, I think, is guilt and despair. Christians suffer. God has not promised all comfort and ease. But here's what Christians should not have. We should not wallow in the hopeless abyss of guilt and despair. Satan, listen to these words, I think they're very helpful. Satan seeks to destroy those who do not have the seal of God. He torments them, I think, by accusing them. That's what the devil does. By reminding them of purposelessness, by driving them further away from God. He brings up to them their dark past. He shows to them a dark future. 
He speaks to them that their lives are riddled with doubts and fears, hopelessness and guilt, it's to such a point that the unbeliever would rather die. So as the devil does this, it, it is a torment, a torture. But what's the purpose of it in their lives? To realize that without God is not the happy thing that people in our society would say, but in fact you need Him desperately. It's mentioned twice in the reading that these torments are limited to five months, long enough, but still partial. They are bringing forward into time the final judgment to come so that there's an opportunity to respond before it's too late. Here again is mercy at work, God's severe mercy. John returns in verses 7 to 10 to his description of these locusts, which are in fact indescribable. Listen to this. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads they wore something like crowns of gold. Their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. I was thinking of these composite pictures that the police put together if they get a description of someone. Yeah. And they hear, well, he's got, like, he's got brown hair and blue eyes and big mouth and oval-shaped face, whatever it might be, and you get a composite picture. Can you imagine putting a composite picture together of these locusts? It would be grotesque, wouldn't it? It is not actually possible. I saw a picture when someone did, you know, in the Song of Solomon, you've got a picture of the woman uh, with flocks of sheep going down her hair. And there was this picture the person made up. <laughs> what a monstrosity this picture was. That's not the nature of this picture language. It's just horror, isn't it? It's devastation. It's terrifying. We might see in these descriptions strength, speed, authority, human involvement in the afflictions, the face and the hair and so on, uh, destructive and consuming attack, defensive strength which can't easily be stopped, noise, dynamism, power, terrifying altogether, and a sting in the tail that's devastating and destroying and debilitating. The prophet Joel spoke about locusts in his prophecy. Um, terrible invasion of locusts who eat everything, of course. Massive army of locusts. And he's speaking about actual locusts, but in fact, he's also speaking about the army of the Babylonians who will come in picture language. And then beyond that, there are hints also that he is speaking about that final day of judgment, the day of wrath. What's the purpose of Joel? Joel's prophecy it makes it very clear. It's to call the people to repentance before it's too late. He says, even now, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. The nature of the woe, and that leads us into the impact of the woe. The message is sobering and unsettling, isn't it? Sobering and unsettling when we think of all the ramifications of what it means. For those who don't belong to Christ, this fifth trumpet and the experience of suffering it speaks of is a solemn call to repentance from God and His mercy. That's the intended impact of this woe. We hear the solemn words of, we heard the solemn words of Jesus from Luke 13, and remember this is Jesus' words in Revelation, but we hear Him speaking in Luke 13, and He speaks about the tower that collapsed and killed a number of folk. And he speaks about others, Galileans, who were offering sacrifices, and Pilate had them killed, massacred them. And well, obviously folk were talking about this. Why did this happen? Like people asked, why did the Twin Towers happen? 9-11, such like. And Jesus' answer is very instructive. 
He says, do you think those who died in these accidents were worse sinners than everybody else? Because this happened to them. No! And then he basically says that everyone is in the same boat as regards sin, as far as sin is concerned. Jesus says to those listening to the crowds there, unless you repent, you too will likewise perish. That's solemn, and it's Jesus himself saying it. These incidents, the tower and the massacre, were a wake-up call to turn to God before it's too late. What then should the impact of this woe be on us? Well, first of all, really importantly, we need to be sure, each one of us, that we have turned to Christ ourselves in repentance and faith, that we trust in Him, that we belong to Him. Have you? Do you have that assurance? And as believers in Christ, we need to be so thankful to God that in His grace and all that happens in the world, we are secure in Christ. We're sealed with that seal. We're secure now and for eternity. It's wonderful. Nothing can snatch those who are His from His hand. The Lord Jesus Christ holds the keys of death and hell. We are united by faith to Him who died for our sin and rose again so we can stand in the judgment. You might think of Paul's words at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, speaking of that sting that we hear about in the scorpions, the tail of the locust, which the scorpions sting. Paul says, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So making sure you are a Christian, rejoicing in being a Christian and the security we have, but there's another important impact on believers that we cannot miss. Murray McShane was a minister in Dundee, a hero of mine, died at the age of 29, following the revival there in Dundee. He died in 1843. He was quoted at the conference. These words I'm going to say here were quoted at the conference I was at, and they, they greatly challenged me. They come from a sermon preached a month or two before he died. Listen to these solemn words. As I was walking in the fields, the thought came over me with almost overwhelming power that every one of my flock must soon be in heaven or in hell. Oh, how I wished that I had a tongue like thunder that I might make all hear, or that I had a frame like iron that I might visit everyone and say, escape for your life. Ah, sinners, you little know how I fear that you will lay the blame of your damnation at my door. Uh, Ezekiel speaks of ministers, elders, really all Christians, or all believers, or believers in God, as watchmen. Ezekiel was called to be a watchman. So that if you say to someone, look, if you carry on like this, the end, you're going to die. This is going to happen. You'll die for your sin. And then that person still goes on and ignores that. Then the watchman has discharged their duty. But if you see somebody that's behaving a certain way and you do nothing and you don't act, you don't act like a watchman, and they, they will die for their sin too if they're going on like that. But these solemn words, you will be held accountable for not having spoken out. Where do those around us in our parish and our town stand in relation to God? Am I, are you being faithful in making it clear as best you can that only in Christ is salvation and security found. And I've been thinking recently about our membership roles for this union that's coming up. The large number of people, names, all unique individuals on our membership roles who have little or no connection with the church, who don't come and little or no interest perhaps, I know that elders faithfully visit. 
what about that? Because I am the elders of pastoral responsibility for those individuals. What should we be doing about that? Hopefully the mission coming up in May will be a great opportunity of us turning outward in gospel mission to those around us in a fresh way. So there you go, this war, this fifth trumpet uh, shows the awful seriousness of sin and it's shown by the fact that it's worth God going this length, allowing this torment to make people see their need to summon them to repentance. May God give you and me a clearer picture of this reality that the need for people to be saved from sin through what Jesus has done, the Lamb who was slain. And may we share God's heart, His love, and be moved to speak for His glory and the good of others. Speak to others about Jesus, the need of Him and what He's done for them, the wonder of it all as we ourselves rejoice in what God has done for us and the security we have in him. May God bless his word to our hearts. We'll have our prayers of intercession after this next hymn. Let's sing, Exalt the Lord our God. This is a short song. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we do indeed worship at your footstool. Holy, you are holy. We exalt your name together. We are holy and true in all your ways. You are good and your love endures forever. 
As we've been hearing today of your work of judgment and mercy to call people to yourself, we stand in awe of this and acknowledge that true and just are your judgments. Your paths beyond tracing out. We worship you. We thank you for your grace towards us in Jesus, that we are ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We are secure in your love, not because of anything we have done or ever could do, but only because of what you have done for us in Jesus. May we be faithful in making Jesus known to others in all we say and do. And may there be many in our town who hear your call, even in their afflictions, and turn to Jesus, finding salvation and eternal life. God, our Father, in this week of prayer for Christian unity, as we know how important unity is to your Son, and we see that in his prayer before he went to the cross, we pray with him for unity of all believers in this town and district, across all the churches, united so that those seeing us will see something of Jesus in us and be drawn to Him. And we pray that specifically as we move towards a planned mission in May here in Hoyk. Thank you for the good meeting of church leaders. May you take hold of us. May this work grow. May it be owned by all your people in this place. And may it be used in your hand for the salvation of many. And may there be a remarkable unity among your people and your churches in and through all this. Protect us from the attacks of the enemy in terms of division or anything else like that. Pray, Father, for our world where there is so much war. Just now, remembering Jesus' words that there will be wars and rumors of wars. These things must happen. The end is not yet. But they are birth pangs of a coming age. We ask you to work out your purposes in all these conflicts, Gaza, Israel, what's happening in Yemen, Iran, Pakistan, Iraq, and Syria around about there, for Russia and Ukraine and many other places. We pray for your mercy and compassion for those who are suffering and for a just peace. And Father, we continue to pray for the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, now refugees in Armenia, May you, the God of endurance and encouragement, meet their needs, and thank you for the privilege of being able to help them. We pray, Father, for those who are going through difficult times, those who are unwell, especially those going through or recovering from major surgery or having treatment that affects them and brings them very low those who are up against it through addiction, mental health issues, a sense of despair, guilt, whatever it may be. We ask that you will be at work by your grace in each of them as we think of them just now. For those who know Jesus, may he keep them, assure them of your forgiveness, love, and hope, and direct them. May they find all things working together for good according to your purposes. For those who have not yet trusted in Jesus, may you do what is needed to bring them to yourself or back to yourself, but in wrath remember mercy, and please bring healing and deliverance to all we're thinking of, for that is your will, Lord, for your glory and your purposes and their good. Let me pray for all those who are bereaved. May they know your comfort in their loss and have the hope of the gospel in their hearts. And now, Father, in the quietness, we bring you our personal concerns. Lord, hear all our prayers as we bring them in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. 
So we finish our service with him. Great is the darkness that covers the earth. Stand to sing.
go now in peace, trusting the Lord. And let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.